everyone. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks since the last video, and I didn't want to go uh, longer than that between videos. Um, and the reason that it's it's been a couple of weeks um, is not because nothing's been happening. Plenty has been happening, but it's been mostly behind the scenes, not really uh, new features to the product. Um, and what's mostly been going on behind the scenes is a lot of a lot of conversations with you all, um, which is really exciting. That's absolutely uh, something to be excited about. Um, however. I don't want to let too much time go between videos. Uh, so I actually have a couple things that I want to show um, probably this week. There will be an announcement later in the week. Uh, but in today's video, I want to talk about two major things that have happened over the course of the last two weeks, um, kind of as a result of, uh, of conversations that I have had with you all. Um, by the way, if you want to have a conversation, if you want to talk about getting Cortex, uh, formerly known as the Sharewell Archive tool, running on your data um, go ahead and, and click on the description on the link in the description below there's links to contact me there's a link to schedule time on my calendar um, i'd love to talk with you uh, about your specific situation because everybody's sharewell setup is just a little bit different um, what the constraints are um, what you've already done on your transition path um, and how an audit and archival tool does fit into your tr transition plans um, so that we can we can get you up and running um, and uh, see how your data looks in Cortex. Um, again, I'm really ex excited about all of this, but in the meantime, there are two things that I want to share. Um, one is an update to the documentation and two is something related to testing. So let's start with a uh, demo of the new documentation. And I'll talk about why I needed to update the documentation. Okay, so here's the documentation site. Uh, it's docs.thoughtcolony.com. That will also be linked in the description. Um, and this page looks exactly the same as it did before. Um, but if we click get started, either one of these links works just fine. Uh, you'll see it looks a little bit different. Um, this get started page was initially a giant wall of text. And uh, after having some conversations with some people, I realized that it was just bad. Um, it was not very helpful. It did, the installation instructions were, um, they, they were just, they were just bad. Um, the installation process is different from how uh, Sharewell's installation process worked um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but because of that, uh, I realized that I really did need to go in depth into the installation process. Um, and I didn't really do that. Uh, I kind of wrote it from a developer perspective and not from the perspective of, of you all um, who may not have installed a, an app quite like Cortex before. Um, and I wanted to fix that. So to start with, the pages are organized very differently. Instead of a wall of text, we have a very short page with the highlights, uh, a couple different ways that you can uh, try out Cortex, uh, including installing it on your own systems, which we'll click that link in just a second. And then of course, troubleshooting, because regardless of how well, how good the documentation is, how well laid out it is, how explanatory it is, I always want there to be a way that you can contact us if you have questions, if you need help, if you need a setup that's slightly different from what we've described. Um, and the two main ways are there's a link to email us or, you know, this YouTube channel, which I will continue to update with both videos like this and uh, in the coming weeks, some more use case oriented demos. Um, that'll be a, a, a good place to go uh, if you run into trouble as well. So let's talk about installing it on your own systems. Um, right now we have two main installation methods. One is IIS, which I expect to be the most common installation path, um, just because that's how Sharewell is installed too. If you're running Sharewell on premises, you already have a, a server running IIS. Whether you use that server or another server, 
and it doesn't really matter, but that's a that's a, a, a deployment scenario that you're familiar with, um, and that's probably what you're going to go with. Um, even if you're not running Sharewell on premises, most people that I've talked to either are familiar with with uh, you know Windows machines, um, or they are running Windows machines. Um, you know, and at the end of at the end of the day, there's nothing stopping you from running this in Azure or AWS or that sort of thing in a Windows VM. You know, Windows is is easy is easy to find. Um, so let's talk about installation and in IIS. I keep forgetting that that link is broken. Uh, this is actually the second time I've recorded this video. Technical issues the first time around. I will fix that link. By the time you watch this video, that link will be fixed. Let's try again. In the sidebar, that link works. Um, this page has been completely rewritten. Um, so not only have the steps been fleshed out and there's more, more context provided with the steps, but it's actually been laid out completely differently into three segments, prerequisites, installation, and configuration. Uh, prerequisites, very simply, you need a Windows machine running IIS and of course your Sharewell database, restored into Microsoft SQL Server. Um, I'm running SQL Server Express because I'm using the Sharewell demo database. Um, SQL Server Express, I think, requires that you are doing things in a non-production environment and your database is smaller than 10 gigabytes. Um, both of those constraints probably uh, take it out of the running. So that means you need to have a licensed version of SQL Server. Um, again, if you do this in AWS or Azure, that license is taken care of for you. But if you're doing this on premises, make sure you have the, the proper versions of SQL Server, otherwise you might run into issues. Um, if you are running Sharewell on premises, you can use the same machine, but you don't have to. In fact, you know, after 2026, I don't have any expectation that you're running Sharewell on any machines. Um, and Cortex doesn't require the presence of Sharewell in order to work. It just requires its code and your database, and that's it. The installation procedure is four steps, uh, the first of which is actually just running an installer from Microsoft. Um, if you have questions about that, reach out to us. I'll explain kind of what that is, what that does. But this link also uh, describes what it is, where it comes from, why it's necessary, and has all, all Microsoft's documentation on it. Then, of course, there's downloading and installing the, the Cortex uh, program itself. And there's some details on where to put it, why to put it there, if you want to put it in a different place, what to make, uh, uh, make, make sure of, what to look out for. Configuring the application in IIS, um, which if you've configured any other application in IIS, this this is exactly the same process as you've done there. Um, obviously, Sharewell's installer does this automatically for you. Um, so this is this is something you may not have seen if you've just gone through the Sharewell installation. Uh, but it's it's a fairly straightforward process, uh, and I added step by step instructions uh, for this. And then finally, well, I removed step four. Step four was configuration, which got its own section. Configuration, um, two things need to be configured. The first is the connection string to the database containing all of the Sharewell data. And the second thing is your Cortex license, uh, which this was not very well described uh, in the previous version of the documentation, um, it was kind of ambiguous. This is not your Sharewell license. Don't put your Sharewell uh, company name and license key in the configuration file. This is a Cortex license key and company name that you get from me. Um, if you don't have a license, uh, result sets are limited to 10 rows. So if you run a search, you'll only get 10 rows back. That's to be expected. There's there's also a little banner that says this is unlicensed. You'll only see 10 rows. Uh, and there's a configuration file, one configuration file that both of these things 
go into with three pieces of information, but really two logical components, the connection string and uh, the licensing information. To build the connection string, there's a link here. You can also go to the sidebar. Um, this is a standard .NET SQL Server connection string. If you're familiar with constructing that, you could skip ahead to the rest of the video. Um, but here's some kind of general documentation on uh, what a connection string looks like that would work for Cortex. Um, and of course, links to the official Microsoft documentation and uh, a site that has a lot of examples. I've used this site um, when I've been connecting to like Azure SQL Server. There's a slightly different format for the, for the connection string because it does authentication a little bit differently. Um, but there are basically five components, well, six, but five and five important ones um, that you can read about here. The most important one, all of all connection strings need this regardless of where your SQL Server uh, lives. Multiple active result sets has to be true. Um, there are some aspects of Cortex that require multiple queries to be going at the same time. Um, this is partially due to the way that uh, I built the tool, but mostly due to the way that Sharewell handles data and definitions both at the same time. Multiple active result sets has to be true. Otherwise, the thing falls over. You don't want that. I don't want that. Make sure multiple active result sets is true in your connection string. OK, that's the documentation. That was a lot. If you have any questions, definitely reach out to me. You can leave comments down on, uh, on the video below. Uh, you can send me an email. Uh, that's all good. Now, I did want to talk about testing. Um, so testing is not a feature. Um, no one should ever brag about, um, oh, we, we did testing. That's, that's what we spent our you know, last iteration doing. However, if you don't test your software, how do you know it worked? So that's why I want to talk about testing. Um, I didn't write automated tests initially. And it turns out that that led to some bugs. There were a few bugs that I fixed over the last few weeks. Um, you may have noticed them. Uh, there's a reason there's a 1.1.1 uh, after, I think I released that a day after I released 1.1.0. Um, that's because there was a bug in 1.1.0. I fixed that, released 1.1.1. Um, but I didn't want to always be fighting the, you know, the regression game. All right, so I implemented a bunch of automated tests, which means that I can go a lot faster and I can trust that uh, the code that I'm building continues to work. It doesn't break uh, some of the stuff that's that's been built previously. Um, so my process is more or less that if I find a bug, I write a test for it, and then I fix the bug, the test passes, um, and this will ensure that the software continues to work uh, the way you expect it to and the way I expect it to. Um, and that, of course, that's not something that I can demo, which is why I don't have one of the main reasons that I don't have an actual Cortex demo um, this week, because I've been spending a bit of time, a fair amount of time, getting that running um, in my, my continuous integration environment um, so that I don't, I don't have to run those tests manually. Uh, I make my changes. I commit them, I push them. If you're familiar with the software development process, you know, committing and pushing, you know, I use Git. Um, I push, the tests run, and I get pretty much immediate feedback uh, if, I, if I broke something. They did actually catch two, two issues um, and prevented bad code from getting deployed to my demo environment. So I also practice continuous deployment, um, which means that the demo site is always, just a little bit newer than uh, the, the version of Cortex that you can download from the, the releases site. Um, so every time I make a change, uh, that demo site gets updated, unless I break something, the tests fail. Um, and I actually had two, two tests fail, uh, frustratingly on the same commit, uh, but 
it meant that I had broken something and I could fix that. I, and I did, I fixed it up, uh, committed, push, and now that went out to the, uh, the demo site. So uh, we've got tests in place. So I'm not gonna say no bugs, but fewer bugs, uh, hopefully, which I know I say fewer bugs and it's a brand new piece of software. Um, the faster I go, the more likelihood of bugs, and I don't want that. Um, so we'll continue to, to focus on testing and focus on, on the quality of, of the code because uh, the validity of, of the code is super important for uh, a piece of software that is intended for audit and archival. That said, if you find a bug, absolutely report it. Please don't be shy. Again, email address in the, in the description below. Um, if you report a bug, I will fix it. I will write it. I will put a test around it so that it doesn't, doesn't break a second time in the future. I think that's all I have for this week. Um, again, there's uh, there's an announcement coming later in the week. Stay tuned for that. That'll be posted on this YouTube channel. So if you're not already subscribed, make sure you su subscribe. If you like what I'm doing here, go ahead and hit that, that thumbs up button. And uh, stay tuned for next week's video where I will have uh, something that I think will be pretty cool. Uh, stay tuned. Thanks for watching. And uh, thanks for thanks for using this software.